Hi everyone, on behalf of the Environmental Leadership Program at East Elgin Secondary School, the Jaffa Outdoor Environmental Education Centre and the Catfish Creek Conservation Authority, I want to welcome you again to our 15th annual Marsh Quest program. Before I turn it over to the feature presentation today, I just want to share with you a little story about this wonderful place we're at today. Actually, when I was a kid about your age, this place didn't exist. Well, it did, but much different than it did today. And what you saw this morning is considerably different than the things I got to see when I was here as a kid. Um, it, took, it took the uh, idea of a bunch of different organizations like Ducks Unlimited and the Conservation Authority and Friends of the Environment and the Elgin Stewardship Council to come up with an idea that they wanted to recreate a natural habitat. And, and that's exactly what they did and what you guys have got to experience today. So that was really cool just to see that transformation over the years. Another thing that's cool about today is the fact that your teachers today at the various stations were once little marsh questers like you. And, and maybe that's something that we'll see down, down the road is that you'll one day be one of the, the future ELPers teaching the next generation of, of, of conservationists. And again, before I turn it over to uh, your feature presentation today, um, I just want to make sure that you guys realize you have a very, very, very important job to do. When you leave today, my challenge to you is to, is to go home and tell as many people as you possibly can, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your brother, your cousins, your friends, as many people as you possibly can, even if you don't know them, stop them and tell them why wetlands are so important. And that's exactly what you're learning today, that they're, they're homes for many, many, many different species of frogs and snakes and turtles and fish and you name it. They're, they're, they're stopovers for ducks and geese as they fly north and south on their migrations. They're, they, they filter our water so that we have clean drinking water. And, and import, most importantly for me, they're just beautiful places to come and spend time and to, and to relax and to enjoy. So that's your challenge today is to, is to go home and, and to, to spread those messages because conservation of these, of these habitats depends on you. Thank you very much. My name is Jenny Pierce and I am here from Sciencational Snakes to do our program for you today. And I am so excited to be here at Marsh Quest. This is a beautiful area that is so important for reptiles and amphibians. And reptiles are the most at-risk group of animals in Ontario, so it's very important to me to educate people about them because you can make a difference to these animals. It may be you who brings them back. Uh, so you can make a huge impact uh, on endangered species or threatened species by the things that you do in your environment. So we are going to go through a bunch of different species today, hopefully some that you have seen or will see, some maybe that are a little more rare and unusual, so they'll be an excellent thing to keep an eye out for and to help, uh, but you will get to see them today. Normally, we get to do a hands-on session. So with our snakes, you get to touch and hold, and sometimes even wear them. And I am so sad that that is not going to be part of our presentation today, but you will see the ELP students experiencing this. And I just want to put it out there. If you ever do get a chance or an opportunity to touch or hold or experience one of these animals, that is great. Wild animals should always be left alone, but of course we have captive bred and raised animals here that we are using for our program. So I'm very excited to get on to our first guest. 
Okay, so I'm hoping that in your adventures outside and uh, maybe on the school grounds or in your home that you have encountered a snake in the wild in Ontario. Now, if you haven't yet, no problem. I'm pretty sure you will at some point. But if you have or are you going, if you are going to, there is a great chance that the snake you are going to encounter is the same kind as our first guest today. Now, this is the most commonly seen snake in Ontario, so I find it funny that so many people call it by the wrong name. I hear people call them grass snake or garden snake because they see them in the grass or they see them in their garden. I've er even heard people call them gardener snake. I don't know why that is because nobody's ever seen one do any gardening. Uh, but their proper name is actually none of the above. These are Eastern garden Garter snakes, garter with a T. And that is because, although all the garter snakes we have here today look a little bit different, they have a little bit different colors and stuff, what you will notice is they are all stripey. They have a stripe down the back and a stripe on either side. Very stripey snakes. Like the garters men used to wear to hold up their socks. In the very olden days, men used to wear garters to hold up their socks and they were stripy like these snakes. So that is where they got their name, garter snake with a T. Now, I mentioned a lot of people see these snakes. That is because of their behavior. These snakes love to come out and laze in the sun. Now, that is a very important thing to know about snakes. They are incredibly lazy. A snake's favorite thing to do is nothing. Now, Helen, of course, is moving around just to make things kind of weird, but uh, she is a beautiful garter snake and she does like to do nothing in the sun. Now, when you see a snake lazing around in the sun, it's not only because they're lazy, it's also because snakes, like all kinds of reptiles, are cold-blooded. Now, you've probably heard that term before, but I don't like it. I do not like it when people call snakes cold-blooded. For one thing, lots of people use that term to mean mean and nasty, cold-blooded killers and oh, so scary. As you can see, our snakes are not mean and nasty. They're really nice. Cold-blooded has nothing to do with their personality. It's actually referring to the temperature of their blood which is the second reason I don't like the term very much, because it can be very misleading. Now in the winter time when they're hibernating, their blood may be really cold, only one or two degrees above freezing. But remember these snakes love to come out in the sun? On a beautiful sunny day like today, these snakes love to come out, lays in the sun, soak up all that heat. Their blood could actually become hotter than yours. They could be a hot-blooded, cold-blooded animal. That's very confusing. I don't like being confused, so I don't like it. I would like, and here's where I need your help. I am trying to get everybody to start using the proper term to describe snakes, not that other term, I'm not even going to say it anymore, but instead we should be calling snakes and other reptiles ectotherms. Now it sounds like a big complicated word, but it's not too bad. Ecto means from outside, therm means temperature. So all it means is snakes are the exact same temperature as whatever they're touching. So if we put these snakes in the fridge, wouldn't be very long, they'd be same temperature as the milk and juice in the fridge. If we put them in the sun where it's very hot, or if these lovely gentlemen are cuddling these snakes in their hands, the snakes will become the exact same temperature as their hands. Whatever they're touching, that's the temperature they are. And that's what it means to be a snake or any other kind of reptile. Now, one more quick note. Some people don't want to touch or hold snakes. Of course, none of us here, obviously. Uh, but some people don't want to because they think snakes are slimy. You hear that a lot. Slimy snakes like those words go together. But it is not true. In actual fact, we are slimier than snakes are. We have oils on our skin. We have sweat glands. Snakes have no oils on their scales. They have no sweat glands. They are actually cleaner and drier than we are. 
They're so clean, they're hypoallergenic. People can't even be allergic to snakes. That's how clean they are. So if you ever do get a chance to touch and hold them, I would certainly take advantage of that. And thank you to our holders today. Okay, so our next guest is a perfect animal to have here at Marsh Quest. Like the garter snakes, these snakes love to come out in the daytime, love to come out in the sun, so people do see them a lot. But these snakes are a lot pickier. Garter snakes love to live around swamps and ponds and lakes and rivers, but they can also be found in fields and backyards and parks and anywhere really. This next snake, if you see one out basking, these girls are probably next to a lake or a pond or a river because they are excellent swimmers. And not only can they swim on the surface of the water, they can hold their breath and dive down underneath the surface, swimming around, holding their breath for over an hour. That's incredible! But it is a very important skill they have because these snakes do like to eat fish and fish can stay underwater for a really long time, their whole lives actually, uh, and they like to eat frogs that are also very good in the water. So they gotta be good at swimming and comfortable in the water. So if you have a snake that eats fish and frogs, is found around lakes and ponds and rivers, really good swimmer, a really good name for this kind of snake would be a water snake. And ta-da, here we have today our native Ontario northern water snake. So as I mentioned, these girls can be found right here in lots of places in Ontario, around lakes and ponds and rivers, so you may see one. But I wanna make sure that everybody understands that if you see a snake or any other animal in the wild, you really should leave it alone. If you saw a skunk in your backyard, you shouldn't run over and pet it. If you see a bear on a trail that you're walking on, don't go up and punch it in the face. And people realize this most of the time, but sometimes they get confused with the snakes. But it's the same thing. If you see a snake in the wild, you should leave it alone. Now this isn't always just for your safety, this is for the safety of the animals as well. Because actually, to a short little snake, you would be a gigantic, terrifying Godzilla monster. So frightening. So these snakes, if you came along, and instead of following our very important rule about leaving them alone, if you came along and grabbed and picked up these snakes, a wild water snake would be so scared for its life, it would have to defend itself. Now, of course, the first thing they're gonna do, first thing they can manage or think about is they're gonna whip around and bite you. Now, snakes, like these water snakes, actually have four rows of teeth on the top two more rows of teeth on the bottom. I didn't tell the handlers this. <laughs> and they are very sharp teeth, <gasps> but they're tiny. So here's the thing. Even if we opened up their mouth, uh, or if you, you got bitten by one, their teeth are so small, you can't see them, and they can't actually do very much damage. A Band-Aid would be extreme first aid for a water snake bite. You wouldn't really need one. But that means it's not a very good defense. So these snakes, they're not gonna deter a predator or a person from hurting them or eating them by biting them. So they've gotta come up with a better way to defend themselves. And they have, certainly in my opinion. So what will happen is if you grab a wild water snake, it certainly will rip around and bite you and you don't care and it's not gonna be a big thing. So they'll let go, they'll stop biting you. They've gotta free up their mouth. You may remember that I said they eat fish and frogs. Those things smell pretty bad to begin with. Well, after a day or two in a water snake stomach, they're super disgusting and you're going to find that out. The reason they've stopped biting you and freed up their mouth is so they can vomit, throw up all over you. Don't worry, these girls, not wild snakes, so they're not going to do that. 
But that is what a wild snake is going to do, throw up on you. And not only is gross stuff coming out the front end, at the base of the tail, like a skunk, they have special musk glands. All they're for is making horrible smelling musk. Now they can't throw it like a skunk, but in this story, you didn't leave the snake alone. You went over and you picked it up and grabbed it. So in your hands, it's gonna be thrashing around. It's gonna be mixing this horrible smelling musk in with the vomit you're already wearing. And because this isn't pleasant enough through the whole procedure, they're also pooing and peeing all over you at the same time. <laughs> so this is why we always do like to leave animals alone in the wild. Now, of course, today, not wild animals. Born and raised in captivity, these beautiful girls, Splish and Splash, are water snakes. Uh, so we don't have to worry about them biting or throwing up or... Uh, musking on you. Can't ever promise anything about pooing or peeing if they have to go to the bathroom. That could happen. Uh, but what they will do for sure is stick their tongue out at you. This is not what I recommend if you're trying to make friends. Don't stick your tongue out at people. It's very rude. Nobody likes that. But for snakes, it's not them being rude. It doesn't mean they don't like you. Snakes use their tongue to smell. And it is incredibly important. Their eyes, although beautiful, can't see very well. And they have no ears. So they can't really see you. They cannot hear you at all. So to get to know you, to say hi, they have to stick their tongue out and smell you. So I like to call them snake kisses. And certainly if you ever do meet a snake that uh, is captive bred and good at being handled, you really want to get a little snake kiss in there so they get to know you and uh, we'll be friends. All right, so our next guests are very, very special. So lots of people see garter snakes and water snakes and they are found all over Ontario. But our next two, these snakes, are very special in Ontario for two reasons. For one thing, black rat snakes like Star and Willow here, are actually the longest species of snake that lives in all of Canada. The whole country of Canada, and this snake has the record for length. Now, Star and Willow are, are pretty long. They're about as tall as our beautiful models here today. But black rat snakes have been known to get over two and a half meters long. So I don't know, can you girls reach your hands up as far as you can from the ground all the way to the tip of their fingers? And uh, maybe a little bit more is the record for a black rat snake. So that is very special because in all of Canada, they're only found in Ontario. That's our province. That's where we are. We win. We have the longest snake in Canada in our province. Unfortunately, the second reason these are a very special snake is they are an endangered species. And what has happened is we have wiped these snakes out from more than half of the places that they used to live in Ontario. There used to be lots of them down here around the north shore of Lake Erie, but they're pretty much gone from this area now. And it's unfortunate. So a big problem that they have is that <laughs> they're actually very good climbers. So these snakes actually believe these girls are trees. Snakes aren't very smart. Uh, they have a great sense of smell with their tongue, so they stick their tongue out and they think really hard, do I eat it? Nope. Does it eat me? Nope. So it must be a tree because they've pretty much run out of brain to think of anything else. So they think these girls are trees and they are very good, this hands-free operation here, because they are just very good at climbing all over them. So they love to climb trees. Not only are they good at it, they need trees as part of their environment. And in Southern Ontario, we have cut a lot of trees down. Now areas like this are awesome. We've planted trees. There's wonderful trees. There's wonderful habitat here and we need more. And these snakes need a place to live. So they are called black rat snakes. They are very good tree climbers. So they do, of course, eat any kind of rodents, squirrels, rats, mice, 
uh, things they can find in the trees. Because they are such good tree climbers, there is a second thing they will eat. They are also known to take birds. Now, of course, adult birds can fly away, but sometimes the little baby birds they fly, they find in the nest, uh, they can make a, a little meal of those as well. So black rat snakes, they're also known as gray rat snakes at this point, um, are an endangered species that used to be here, but it'd be very, very special if you found one now. If you ever did manage to catch a glimpse of one of these snakes, it is important to report your sightings. You can really help out science just as a citizen. If you are out and about and spot an, a snake, lots of people can take pictures with their phones and you could report this. Uh, there are atlases and groups that you can find to report your sightings and that would be incredibly beneficial to these animals and to our knowledge and how to help them. Also, of course, plant a tree. Not only is it possibly going to help out a black rat snake, it's great for birds and us because trees actually clean the air that we breathe. So yay trees and yay black rat snakes. Hopefully we keep them around. Okay. So now one of the problems that uh, the black rat snakes have as well as loss of trees and habitat is they sometimes come out and cross roads and they get hurt that way. But we have another animal in Ontario, another reptile that has a huge problem with roads. And that is of course, turtles. We have eight different kinds of turtles in Ontario. And sadly, all eight of them are listed as species at risk. We are worried about all eight of our turtle species. And our next guest is a fantastic kind of turtle species that is listed as threatened. We are quite worried about this type of turtle and it's an adorable kind of turtle. Now I'm not a big fan of the name. This is called a Blanding's turtle, but I don't think he's bland or boring. I think he's really cool. And an actual much better name in my opinion would be yellow chin turtle because Blanding's turtles always have this solid yellow chin. Now they could also be called helmet head turtle because they also have a very high domed shell on the top. Yep, so they kind of look like an army helmet. And so they're pretty easy to recognize. And unfortunately where a lot of people see them or where they're recognized from is on the road. Because in the springtime, the mother turtles, the mother Blanding's turtles and many of our other species of turtles, they leave their perfectly safe and comfortable, wonderful lakes, ponds and rivers they live in and they start wandering around on land. Now, of course, turtles are very slow, so they, they don't do anything quickly and they certainly don't walk on land very quickly, even though they're going a long way to lay their eggs. These are mother turtles. They've left their lakes and ponds and rivers to find a great place to lay their eggs. But unfortunately, in doing this, they sometimes cross roads. So it's very sad because what it means is that most of the time when we hit turtles on the roads with our cars, we are hitting mother turtles, pregnant female turtles, and it is very much hurting, decimating turtle populations in Ontario. So it sounds all very scary and not good, but you can make a huge difference. If you are in a car, if you're too young to be driving, that's fine. Drivers, you have to still pay attention to all those important things like staying on the road and don't hit things and people in other cars, stay in the lines and stuff. But if you're a passenger in a car, that's awesome. Your job is to watch the road for turtles. So if you're watching the road for turtles, you'll see them way in advance and you can tell the driver if the driver can safely pull over and stop. And if you can safely get out and move that turtle off the road, I want you to realize you're probably not just saving one turtle. There is a very good chance you are saving that turtle and all the eggs that she's carrying. And if you save her that year, she can lay eggs the next year. And the year after that, a Blanding's turtle, for example, probably lays eggs for well over a hundred years in a row. 
you could be saving a thousand baby turtle eggs by taking 30 seconds out of your day and moving a turtle off the road. Now there are some very important rules for moving the turtles. For one thing, when you see them on the road, make a note of which direction they're heading. So the head, that's where they're going. The tail, that'll be pointing towards the way they came from. And so when you go up to a wild turtle, you very gently pick them up like a sandwich on both sides, just like this. And of course a wild turtle, not Bo here, because he is of course not a wild turtle, born and raised in captivity, but a wild turtle will be really afraid of you. So it's going to pull its legs and its head inside its shell. Bo has a big shell on top and also a huge shell on his belly. There you go, you can see that. So he can fit his, believe it or not, his big head and his big tail and his legs all fit inside that shell. So you just go up and you pick them up and carry them in the direction they were going and leave them on the side of the road to continue their journey. Do not put them in your car and take them home. That is against the law to keep them as pets. Don't drive them back to the nice pond you saw. That's probably where they started from, but they're on a mission, they're on a quest. So it is very important that they are able to continue it to go and lay their eggs. So just right off the side of the road, leave them there, but you are making a huge difference to conservation in Ontario when you rescue a turtle. Now I mentioned for the turtles that you see uh, on the road and in Ontario, you just walk up and you pick them up like a sandwich. There is one exception to that rule, and we're gonna bring out another guest. Okay, so our largest turtle species in Ontario, and this turtle does have a bit of a nasty reputation, which is so undeserved. These are awesome turtles. Now, he has a very big head, very big shell, like I said, largest turtle in Ontario, very huge tail, looks like a big old dinosaur. And this is of course our native Ontario snapping turtle. Now of course people are like, oh, snapping turtle. Why are they called that? And why would we uh, want to deal with one of these animals? Well, they are called snapping turtles because if they get scared or are nervous, they snap to defend themselves. So unlike the Blandings turtle that we just saw with the big hard shell on the top, now he has a big hard shell on the top, this turtle has a tiny little shell on the bottom. Now I don't know if you can do this, can you switch to the side and flip him up so you can see his belly? He doesn't like this part of the show. Ah, so he's very upset because you can see that little tiny shell on the belly and his huge legs and his huge head and his huge tail. Unlike the Blanding's turtle that can pull inside his shell, snapping turtles cannot do that. Awesome display there. So they are very scared on land because they can't outrun any predator. Their snapping turtles are very slow on land. So if a predator walks up to them and flips them over, they just get eaten alive. And that is horrible. They really don't like that to happen. So they can't protect themselves with the shell. So that is why they snap instead. So it's very important. If you see a snapping turtle on land, you should stay away from it. Now that's very easy because it's a turtle. You can crawl faster than this snapping turtle can run at full speed. There is no way that you should be able to get snapped by a snapping turtle unless you walked up to it and stuck your fingers or your toes or your knees in its face. So don't do that. They are not dangerous animals, no more than chairs. I was kind of curious, so I did some, some research on dangerous things and I found out that chairs are terrifying. You can pick up a chair and hit yourself in the head with it, it can kill you. You can even fall off of them. And more people are killed by chairs every year than have ever been killed by snapping turtle. I don't think anybody's ever been killed by a snapping turtle. So these are much safer than chairs. Now, if you do see one on land, you definitely wanna stay away from it. But what I find funny is then people think if they're going swimming, and they see snapping turtles in the water, they think they don't wanna go swimming with them. 
and that is incorrect. You do not want to go swimming in a lake or pond or river that doesn't have snapping turtles in it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First off, although snapping turtles are very scared on land and very snappy, they have no predators when they're underwater. So nothing eats them, nothing to defend themselves against. They don't snap to protect themselves underwater. You can swim with snapping turtles, you could step on them on the bottom of the lake and they'll just swim away. No worries. Uh, so quite safe to swim with. And why do you want them there? That is because of what they eat. So snapping turtles, they like to eat meat. They are not um, plant eaters. They don't like to eat vegetables or fruits. They want to eat meat. Now we have studied snapping turtles for a long time. So we have a long list of things that they like to eat. And they've been known and recorded eating fish and frogs, of course. They've also been known to eat raccoons and skunks. They'll eat squirrels and chipmunks. I have seen snapping turtles eat a white-tailed deer. They have been also recorded eating moose. And this is my favorite, bears. Snapping turtles eat bears. I mean, what eats bears, man? That's terrifying. But snapping turtles have been known to eat bears. Of course, there's a huge problem with this list. Everything on it is much larger and much smarter and much faster, not always larger, but certainly smarter and faster than this snapping turtle, unless they're dead. Dead animals are very slow moving, possibly less intelligent than a snapping turtle. And after being dead for a little while, they start to let off a lovely odor. Okay, it's not a lovely odor. Rotting animal. It's a horrible smell to us. But to a snapping turtle, it is the dinner bell. They have an amazing sense of smell. They can smell dead animals in the water. They go right to them and eat them all up, which is really disgusting. Except that I'm very happy because I don't want to swim in a lake or a pond or a river that is full of dead, rotting animals. So these are like nature's garbage people. They're out there working away, cleaning up all the dead, rotten, disgusting stuff and keeping our ecosystems healthy and clean. And that allows us and all the animals to have great places to live and clean water and be healthy. So this could be possibly the most important animal for our health in Ontario. But sadly, snapping turtles are a species at risk. We are worried about them. So if you do see a snapping turtle on the road, please stop and help it across. But of course, like we said, if you see them on land, you do want to stay away from them. So you want to stay away from the snapping turtle and move it across the road, which that seems tricky. But they are a snapping turtle. So if you can find a stick or a branch at the side of the road, or maybe even that Phragmites, that horrible invasive plant, yank all that out you want. But yank out a long piece, poke the snapping turtle in the face with the far away end from you. It'll probably snap on. Then you have a leash and you can drag your turtle off the road. Don't have to touch it or get near it or have anything to do with it. It's wonderful. Except you are saving one of the most important animals in Ontario. Okay, so everything we've shown you so far have been native Ontario animals, species that you can find or hopefully find in our province. But we do find at programs that a lot of people get very enthused about snakes and think about keeping some as pets, perhaps. You can't keep our native species as pets. That They're protected by law and, of course, as we mentioned again and again, always best to leave wild animals alone. But if you are interested in a pet snake, my personal favorite, I think the best pet snake out there, is corn snakes. 
And corn snakes, as you can see, come in a ton of different colors, and they even come in different patterns. There are over 200 variations in colors and patterns in corn snakes. So that's one of the things that makes them really cool for pets. They are bred in captivity. They are not taken from the wild, so that is very important. You don't want to be taking animals from their homes and from the wild and trying to keep them in captivity. But corn snakes, for thousands of generations, have been kept as pets in captivity. They're also nice because they don't get too large. All of these individuals you can see, these are adult corn snakes. They are full grown and quite easy to manage. Certainly don't have to move out and give them a whole room as they get bigger like some of the large boas and pythons. And also a wonderful thing about corn snakes is that they originate and are still found in the wild in the United States. They range from Florida to New Jersey. So what that means is they're not from an environment that is a desert or a rainforest and therefore difficult to make in captivity. They're actually from an area that is very similar to your house to what it's like in your house, the same temperatures and humidities. So whatever your house temperature and humidity is, these snakes can be healthy at that temperature and humidity. So that makes them wonderful as pets. But it is important before you ever think about even getting a pet to do a lot of research and learn about them before you bring one home. But I hope you have enjoyed today. I hope you've learned a little bit about our wonderful reptile species here in Ontario. And I encourage you to get it there and hopefully see them for yourself.